Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for this month's Dynasty Titan Artist Series. This month's Artist Series will feature Dynasty artist Matt Penland. Matt Penland is currently a U.S. Air Force percussionist, a quad tech for the Santa Clara Vanguard, and a percussion arranger for the Guardian Drum and Bugle Corps, the Hawthorne Caballeros, and Music City Drum and Bugle Corps. Matt's clinic today will be over conversations on arranging for marching percussion. I hope you guys enjoy. Hey Matt, how's it going? Pretty good. What's up, man? Hey, I'm doing well. Just just hanging out here in my house, um, just keeping up with the times. How are you doing? How's everything going so far? Um, pretty good. Still at home. Still stuck at home. Haven't been doing much actual Air Force work, but staying busy. It's good. Yeah. So, what have you been? What have you been up to then? What have, What have you been keeping up with? Um, mostly, I've been writing a lot of music. I'm um, still like trying to keep up with a lot of marching band writing and did a couple of videos that maybe people have seen like through the Air Force and, and um, we're like doing outreach that way. So a lot of people are just making videos from home. That's like yeah. really to keep up with the outreach stuff. Um, but that's slowed down because we did so much at the beginning of the quarantine that we have the backlog of videos. So they're like, okay, hold on. Don't make any more videos. <laughs> yeah. So that's what it's, so that's through the Air Force? Yeah, that's like the, the the Air Force sponsored videos. We're doing outreach with people that send us videos. We did mm -hmm. some like duets with younger students through, you know, splicing videos together and stuff like that. And that was cool. That was oh. kind of the beginning of the stay at home order type of things that I've been doing. Yeah, yeah, nice. That's, re that's really, really cool. Okay, so you're a percussionist in the Air Force band, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. It's been, I just finished five years i think or i just started my fifth year yeah i just Dang, enlisted in the military which is crazy for me to yeah that's, that. <laughs> yeah that's really really awesome do you how did you get that job like what is how, how do you go about that process yeah so um after i finished school it's it's just like a um if people are familiar with like the orchestral audition circuit it's just another audition process like that to start and um you know i saw it advertised and I was taking orchestral auditions during that time and that was the next audition up. And um, the biggest difference is after you win the audition, you go to basic training and join the military, which is crazy. But the beginning of the process is the same as every other audition anyone's ever done. You know, I went, I came here to DC and did an in-person audition, got the job. And then you, after that, then you got to decide like, okay, are you going to join the military? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Which clearly I did. And it's been, you know, the most amazing experience of my life. The greatest job I've ever had. It's, been totally worth it. it it was scary at first that idea but it's been amazing you know that's really awesome to hear i'm sure there are a lot of people that that you know if they're looking for something to do outside of teaching or outside of you know outside of writing music or something like that that's a that's a viable option for a lot of percussionists and musicians i think that's a that's super super cool that you get to share that with us um on the side what what else do you do i know that you're you're a quad tech i know that you're arranging for some groups could you kind of elaborate on that and, and what those groups are and, and who yeah so are. outside of my air force job i've been like um i guess my longest standing position is i've been teaching at santa clara since 2012 um helping with the quads and the percussion and drum line and um you know teaching locally i used to live in texas and lived in chicago and now i live in virginia teaching thomas jefferson high school here um, which is a big, um, has a big parent band program here in the area, teaching George Mason indoor drumline. So 
this nice. is like my WGI affiliation right now. Um, and then recently been designing and arranging for Music City Drum Corps in uh, Nashville. We got Guardians Drum Corps in Texas. And I also am the battery ranger for Hawthorne Cavaleros, which is a DCA nice. core up in the Northeast as well. Another dynasty group. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. That's very awesome. So you've been, a, you, you've been around for a little bit. So you, a little bit. so could you, could you kind of elaborate on, on your history with dynasty kind of what, how long you've been an artist and, and that relationship and, and how that's yeah. gone? So I, I was thinking about this recently. I didn't even like realize that I was actually first introduced to dynasty when I was in high school. I grew up in North Carolina, you know, kind of the middle of nowhere. Some high school, we had a great band director, great percussion program. And my junior year, we actually like bought used dynasty drums from the Glassman Drum and Pugil Corps. Nice. I don't forget how excited I was, but I didn't even like think about how long my relationship with dynasty has been. So I was like 16 when I got full set of dynasty quads. We had like two spots, everything, the old yeah. version of the drums. And that was like crazy when I was in high school and I was already like a huge quad nerd by that time. So that was like such a huge upgrade. I was freaking out versus our old like broken drums we had for years and years. Um, and then that rolled over into going to college at North Texas, which of course mm -hmm. has always had a relationship with Dynasty. By the time I was in school, Paul Rennick was a Dynasty artist, so that relationship was there. I marched Phantom Regiment, marched Santa Clara Vanguard, Ben on Center. It's like there's hasn't been many years of lull in between, you know, my love for the instruments. And then once I became a professional, I think I, I officially joined the artist roster, I think in 2017. Cool. Um, and started like giving more clinics and doing more outreach and educational stuff for them. But I've always been a fan of the instruments pretty much my whole life of, of drumming. Yeah, the custom elite tenors are definitely definitely something something to look at. They they're fully constructed. They have the metal plate um, that don't wiggle at all. Going through a full season of drum corps, how do those quads hold up? Uh, surprisingly well. It's it's amazing. Yeah, I mean. I, I, at Vanguard, we even get new drums every year, but I mean, you don't, you wouldn't need that. I mean, I have them for high school here locally that I've got. I used them when I was in high school. It's like specifically the quads are so incredible because of that, like, you know, the back bar system and the, and keeping all the drums together. There's not any really moving parts. It's like, yeah, I mean, I remember in 2010 when the, um, I think maybe that was the first year that the custom elite came out and with the new updated carrier too, it didn't have the J bars and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had used it for years and then we got it at Phantom Regiment and it was like, I remember it, like, instantly the first day we were all just like, Oh my God, somehow this got even better. It was even more secure and the carrier yeah. even better. And like everything felt so, it always feels so flat and you're never worried about the drums being at different angles. You have to adjust them after a couple of seasons of use. It's like always flat always the same. I can get any set of dynasty quads at any clinic I'm doing all over the nation and like, no, I'm going to play the quad solo exactly like it felt at home on my drums here. It's like, yeah, never any adjustments. It's so incredible how they're always the same between every single set. It's like, yeah, there's nothing that, there's no other company or set of quads I've found yet that compared to that like consistency. Wow, man. I, I really appreciate that. It's, it's, <laughs> it's true. I mean, I've been using them for my whole life and yeah. Well, I'm definitely super proud that you, you continue to, to support the quads and continue to support Dynasty. So um, going moving on, thank you for all the history that you've just given us in, in the audience. Um, the really, really awesome history with Dynasty and a really awesome history as a composer and as, as a teacher and as a performer. I congratulate you on that. And I, we've worked together in the past, even before I worked with Dynasty, um, yeah. doing, doing, that, <laughs> doing those videos. Like that was, that was all, that's such a... That's such like a crazy mind thing of just like, oh, I was shooting and filming Dynasty before I was even here. So, but moving on. So could you kind of share with the audience what your clinic is going to be over today and kind of, kind of elaborate on what you plan on sharing with us? Yeah. So I was trying to think about different things I could talk about on these clinics. Um, and then I just kind of came to, I should probably talk about what I'm doing the most these last two months in quarantine. It has been just writing and arranging music every day, you know? And my regular job is to be, I'm like a professional performer and we give concerts in the Air Force and I'm a player. But recently, you know, my side job has grown because I'm not playing as much concerts. So every day I've been writing music for different, uh, mostly marching band groups, getting ready for the fall. We did, we still were writing some drum course stuff when the quarantine started. So I'm pretty 
heavy into that and I have a lot of groups right now and I just kind of planning on talking about my thoughts about writing and maybe some of my compositional techniques or arranging techniques that I've used in the past 10 years just meant to be I don't know kind of a look into the way I do it just to give mm -hmm. some ideas hopefully for other young composers or just composers maybe that are my age and above that are just interested in getting new ideas I, by no means am I hoping to present a clinic on the way to do it just a way to do it and hoping to yeah. inspire people to get some new ideas well that's awesome I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of people that especially with everybody being inside recently that are looking for new things to do and looking for new information to find so i'm sure a lot of people are going to be very thankful for the information that you're going to give us today so um with i guess without without anything else left to say let's go ahead and dive into your clinic all right Hey everyone, I thought a good place for me to start might be talking about how I started getting involved with writing Martian percussion and just the notation programs at all, writing music on the computer. Um, for me, it started when I was in middle school. I was lucky enough that I have an uncle who was involved with um, marching percussion and taught some drum lines um, in Ohio. I, and he was visiting me and my family down in North Carolina one time he knew I was a percussionist in middle school, and I had some interest in drumline at that time. And he brought me an old copy of Finale that he wasn't using anymore, and an old copy of the Virtual Drumline Library, which was a big deal back then. I think it was the original one, maybe. And um, he set it up on my parents' computer, and he kind of showed me how to get started writing. And then from there, it was, you know, it was my new hobby in middle school. It was getting home from school and playing around with finale and figuring out new rhythms and trying to write a drumline cadence or just some groove or something. And really at that young age, it, it helped me discover what rhythms were and, you know, what could be done with music. And the playback was a big thing for me at the time. I remember it really helping me learn how to read music quicker because I had to understand how to write the rhythms and I could play them back. And it, it was a great tool for me at the time. Um, I actually have a copy here of the original first thing I ever actually wrote. I used to, um, you know, write what I considered the cadence in middle school, and I would save them and print them out in this notebook, and I went back and found the very first one I ever wrote, which I thought was kind of funny and be cool to share. You know, I, I could see the progression when I went back and found my own notebook a couple days ago of starting like this i had no you know no dynamics no anything no you know i don't know just a different style of writing obviously i was just discovering it and it's you could see it evolve over time to what it is now it was just it was fun at the time and it's funny to go back and and see what i was thinking as a 14 year old trying to write drumline cadences anyways fast forward you know when i was in college it was maybe getting more serious i was always still interested in writing and um, was lucky enough to live with my friend who's my writing partner now, Tyler Sammons, in undergrad. We lived together. We were both interested in writing and I think there was one day where we were like, hey, we should write a show together because that'd be fun even though we didn't have anyone to write it for. So the very first thing we ever wrote together was just a random idea, again, just like a hobby project for us. We wrote a three-part show. We had like a storyline mapped out. We had this, you know, ideas about the music and just had a sound file ready and kind of just stored it away like this was a cool project. This was fun. We'll put it away. Um, and then that snowballed into, of course, maybe the first writing gig we got was for a school we taught and then so on and so forth. Um, funny thing, the very first show we ever wrote, that one that was for no one, we actually ended up reusing it many years later when a school came to us looking for, you know, a prearranged show that could just be slightly modified for their group. And we sent them that sample and they really liked it. So the first project that we thought was just for fun ended up actually being useful later. Um, so that's just a little bit of the background. Um, today, I just wanted to talk through my percussion arranging process. And I'm going to use two different scores, ones that I've previously worked on. 
um, to demonstrate some of the steps that I take to get it to a finished product. Hey everyone, so the first score I'm going to go through just as an example of my process is um, an arrangement of Sorcerer's Apprentice that I've done with the Wind Arranger Evan Van Doren. So usually it'll start like this. This is you know the original wind score that I get from Evan or the band director or whoever happens to send it. I'll play it. Right, so you get the gist. Now the next step for me personally is usually that I, I wanna take these wind parts and maybe this is a little um, more logistical, but I, I like working out of a template that I know that is gonna work well with the sounds that I'm used to using, which are the virtual drumline sounds. So what I end up doing is there's a plugin that I, I don't need to go into the details of the Sibelius plugin, but that lets you take this sketch and put it all of the same measure numbers and rehearsal marks and everything into a blank score. So now I have all the instruments I have included because I'd preset up this template that I want to use, the drumline a couple of marimbas, vibes, just basic instrumentation if I'm not sure what it's gonna be yet for the high school group. And then you can see at the top it has all of the rehearsal letters. It even imports the, um, the title and some other things as well. And then I usually will take, I can highlight all the wind parts at once, put them into my new score, Evan's very kind to supply kind of a mock-up synth part for so you, I can know what he's thinking for the structure of the whole arrangement. And I put that in here too. And now I have same original wind score, but in a setting that I'm used to writing in where I know all the virtual drumline sounds and other sound libraries that I want to use will work. Okay, so the first step for me is usually kind of messing around with the piano part and the way I like to do it you know nine times out of ten I'll I will if I'm doing the front ensemble arrangements I will try to make a piano reduction version or expand upon what's already provided to me that I know that I'm gonna flush out to become the front ensemble parts so I kind of usually not writing anything I'm trying to figure out the parts that were already provided So kind of figuring out some harmonies, what what more can I do there to fill it out, to set up the wind parts, I'll usually try to learn, you know, the main voices of the wind part. So I know what I'm leading to, right? So fast forward to, I've messed around, try to figure out a couple ideas, and this is what I've come up with as kind of an intro. And that leads us to the wind parts. You notice I'm trying to use, you know, I am definitely using some of the same harmonies that were provided, change the rhythm a little bit and embellish it with this little, you know, chromatic figure, which I know, you know, kind of sets up the mood for Sorcerer's Apprentice because I've listened farther into the score and I'm trying to foreshadow for stuff that's to come. This gives me at least, I have some harmonies. I have a couple rhythms here and like the chromatic idea that I can work with as I'm putting it into the mallet parts, right? Let's listen to this one more time. All right, 
right. So then fast forward, you know, a couple more steps. I've taken the piano part we originally had and literally here and literally like kind of copied and pasted or put rhythms into or sorry, put different phrases into different sections to orchestrate it for percussion, not necessarily keeping the exact same piano part. So you, you'll be able to hear um, that same piano idea that I composed layered throughout the different sections now, hopefully. Let's hear this. Yeah, apologies for some of the sounds. Um, but you can see, usually I'm gonna start like this with maybe just one marimba part. I think I did two vibe parts here to start um, just so I could get this idea in. Split between two players. But it's still pretty barren. I, I, I usually am not adding any percussion parts. In my opinion, xylo and glock, I'm usually not doing right off the bat because I feel like those might be accents or um, special textures. And then you can see I kind of decided early on where I think the battery should come in. You know, maybe I was thinking, usually I want the battery to come in a couple beats before the first band entrance, because that's, you know, think about rehearsing on the field, you want the battery to come in first, so the band has something to listen to. So I, I made sure that was a priority and didn't really think too much past that yet, just this wanted to make sure the band has a big obvious rim shot the beat right before they come in with the triplets right to make that entrance easier assuming that the drill is friendly there you know those are still conversations you can have during the process of learning it and um, during the design process so we got a little bit more flushed out here and finally we um, fast forward to the finished product or what I ended up doing for this first phrase. So hopefully you can see, you know, the marimba part, marimba one part and some of the vibe parts pretty much remaining the same. And, and then I just kind of added some extra colors, maybe different octaves in the marimba to get um, it to sound a little more full. That's here how the keyboard parts turned out based on that piano, original piano reduction that I had made. Cool. So, you know, I guess the biggest thing I added here, the marimba and xylophone added a run that wasn't originally in the piano reduction I had made, but you know the melody still here in the Glock and the vibes that was from the original piano thing, which will still come through because of the metal orchestration. Um, yeah, and then I guess you know you could talk about Amelia and little tiny decisions I made, but those can you know those are all individual decisions based on the composer or the arranger. Um, some colors that I ended up adding here and the rack to keep um, the players involved. And that's another concept that I like to think about a lot, especially for high school groups is if you know, you know, for example, they're gonna have three people playing percussion. I really do my best to make sure that they're all staying involved or they all at least have some parts going on um, and not, you know, a minute of extended rest even if to be honest even if it doesn't seem the most appropriate to have a triangle note or suspended cymbal roll or something there sometimes I add a little more than is necessary to make sure that the players can be involved in the process in the music making and then up here finishing out the batter idea that I started so I decided that these last two bars kind of should be a battery moment or just like a, a little small window before we set up the um, first melody of the flute entrance. A s part of the step-by-step -step process that can't show on a computer screen is that I'm usually 
you know, on my own instrument at home, trying to play these parts to see what they look like and see how they feel as a player. So here's like an example of this. Remember one part, what that would look like. So you can see I, I kind of making sure that it feels right to me or I can like notice different, you know, the range of the instrument. How does it, how is it going to look um, from the audience to have the, you know, changes in octaves and things like that. I make those decisions based on how it feels to play it usually, especially a moment like this where it's just the front ensemble starting off the uh, movement by themselves. So let's hear it, how it ended up all together the first 30 seconds or so. So what are some things I wish I knew when I was getting started? I think the first thing I, I, or first bit of advice I'd have as anyone getting started that I wish I had heard more when I was younger was just experiment writing music. Don't be afraid to, I mean, it could be on Sibelius or Finale or uh, some type of music free uh, music notation software. It could just be with pen and paper and pencil and paper. I did that plenty too. That used to be, you know, on the back of my tests in school when I was finished with tests, I'd be scribbling out rhythms and trying to figure out how to write different rhythms outside of the notation program um, just to experiment and see what would come out. Um, the better you get at notation and understanding how to write out rhythms and how to work with Sibelius or Finale or some computer or program like that, the better or the more you'll be able to focus on just the actual music writing part when you are um, actually composing your first piece, right? You won't be focused on the logistics as much or getting, you know, it's easy to get frustrated sometimes with the computer programs, but the more you know ahead of time, the more you can just focus on the music aspect. And I think that was, is really important um, to remember. Another thing I wish I had done a little bit more of sooner when I was younger is get used to writing battery and front ensemble parts. Try not to limit yourself to saying, I'm gonna only do this or only do that. It's, it might seem daunting to do one or the other if you, you know, if you have a strength. I clearly had a strength when I was younger. You know, I, I was a drummer and I was in drum lines and I was a, a quad drummer. So mallets kind of scared me at a younger age. So I always thought I could never write for them. There is no wrong. Just try it and you'll get better at it, right? I think there's too, there's too many people that might shy away from it because they think I can't write drumline music because there's, there's, it doesn't sound right. Well, remember that there is no such thing as a right way to do it or a right thing to, to write out in a certain phrase or a piece that you're working on because innovation comes out of those gray areas that don't seem right. So have some confidence in just your own experiments that somebody's gonna think that's really cool and you probably think it's really cool. So it's, it's worth writing no matter what. Um, yeah, take new ideas or get new ideas from anywhere. I, I think I, I'm constantly looking for new ideas or you know, in my writing through music on Spotify I'm listening to. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always watching and trying to keep up with the most recent marching percussion videos and trends like WGI, DCI, BOA, just groups that have different styles than my own and trying to take things from that 
to just be as well-rounded as I can, I, I get inspiration from music that I'm playing in the Air Force Band all the time. Some rep that we're working on um, in rehearsals might inspire me for some new rhythm or thought of some new um, sticking or something I hadn't thought of before because of the piece I'm working on. Um, and always, nowadays, I'm, I'm getting inspired from my own students that I'm teaching. You know, I see them hacking or practicing during a water break or something in the corner. And, and it's, you know, it's, of course, because of the generational gap, sometimes something I never would have thought of or something new. And I always try to go up to them and be like, hey, what was that? Can you show me that? And try to learn from them to, to just give myself another new perspective, right? I think that's important. And it comes through in people's writing when they have multiple perspectives like that. All right, the next score that I wanted to share with you guys is um, actually from Guardians Drum and Bugle Corps, 2019 summer. This is their closer. Um, the wind parts were arranged by Doug Thrower. I did the battery parts, and my writing partner and best friend Tyler Sammons did the front ensemble parts. So I thought I'd, I picked this one because it's a little bit different genre, where it's drum corps rather than marching band. Um, and a different case where I'm just writing the battery parts and it's a specific drum feature, so maybe approach it a little bit differently. So this is kind of, this is the finished product up into where the drum break starts or the percussion feature started um, with the synth or piano parts that Doug provided us. So you can see it's about three phrases of just percussion before the horns come back in. So I'm looking at the form for stuff like that when I'm starting this. And then you might also notice, it might be kind of small on your screen, but the entire movement was a continuous excel. So the drum feature starts at 170, it ends at 208 beats per minute, and we need to find a way to get through those different tempo changes um, to keep the pacing of the piece going. So let's hear what it sounds like first. I'll start one phrase before the um, percussion feature starts. the provided outline from Doug so we know what the vibe should be. that's where the horns enter back in, right? Um, so obviously it's kind of the same melody repeated over and over. He's just given us an idea for us to expand upon, for Tyler and I to expand upon. So my first step, I think usually in a case like this, I might come at it first um, as the battery arranger and give Tyler some ideas about what I'm thinking before he embellishes the melody because we already have that to start with. This is a concept I've been doing a lot recently. If I'm just writing the battery parts, kind of like I talked about with the piano parts when I'm writing for front ensemble, I kind of write a piano reduction first. For the battery recently, I've been adding an extra, you know, single line underneath the battery staves right here to act as my like piano reduction of the battery. And I just am using this to like map out in my mind some big accents or big uh, important rhythms or shaping that I know I want to put um, orchestrate out into the battery afterward. So for example, I knew that I wanted to start this drum break with or this percussion feature with at least one strong statement and then it's going to be we're going to have to utilize a lot of shaping within it to make it seem like it grows over the course of a long period of time. So I, I'll do something like this.
maybe it'll just be that much of a skeleton. All right. I know that I want there to be one measure of loud followed by some decrescendo, maybe it'll be a buzz roll. I try to really just break it down to bare bones skeleton. Here in the outline, it helps, it helps me keep track of phrases, big macro phrases, and, I, and it helps Tyler once I have the full you know, percussion part mapped out, the battery part mapped out, it helps him know where I came from so that he knows you know, what I feel like are the most important accents based on what I was thinking first in the outline. Sometimes I can get kind of lost when you're writing really dense parts, right? So maybe I'll finish up some of the thoughts I had with this outline. Okay, so now we have at least a little bit more of a skeleton here. You can see at the bottom, I filled in a couple more phrasing ideas. Got a crescendo for two bars. Kind of recall back to the first all accented measure maybe. Um, you know, these are kind of my first, first big picture ideas I would start with and then I I kind of sing through the melody or play the melody on the piano a couple times and you know write down the first thing that comes to my head if I'm hearing this right knowing that of course maybe the eighth notes triplets weren't gonna stay there because we're gonna embellish on the melody but you know, for example, that was an idea. I knew I wanted to do some type of duple to triple to make some tension leading to the end of that next phrase. It makes it seem like it's rhythmically changing as the tempo is about to change because each one of these double bars is where I had a tempo change. So I know that some, I got to make sure there's something important happening or some obvious, something obvious leading to each one of those tempo changes. Now, another thing that I like to do is kind of have some ideas in mind already um, with the group that I'm writing for. In this case, it was Guardians Drum and Bugle Corps. You know, based on how I know that group was playing and the the skills that they're good at, based on their warm up packet and what the staff's been telling me and, and videos I've seen of them playing throughout the summer or camps, um, I like to have like a bag of grab bag of um, rudiments or stickings or something that I, I want to. I know I want to incorporate, especially in like. Uh, percussion feature like this. So one for them in particular um, last summer was I really was trying to focus on this type of skill. They had a lot of, I don't know, all those kind of inside sixes but they're inverted and I just wanted to incorporate that sticking. I think I had done it a couple other times in the show and they had a warm that really focused on this so I knew it was maybe something they wouldn't need to, it wouldn't be a whole new skill for them. And around this tempo, I kind of try to figure out like, okay, 
that sticking would feel good in a 16th note rhythm. So I take, I literally just jot down that idea and put it in whatever measure, because I I just remember, okay, I want to include something like this somewhere. And I'll copy and paste it in the appropriate place after I figure out where it might fit. Another idea that I knew I wanted to do with them was, you know, they had, there was a request for like, I feel like we, we want to play, we've been working on rolls and extended rolls. Can we have something in the drum feature that's just like a long extended roll, like a very long phrase? So I was like, yeah, absolutely. But I'm trying to find a way to include it. Triplets seemed a little too fast because we're picking up tempo. Maybe it'd be uncomfortable for a long period of time. So I chose, I, I had, as I'm doing the outline, I think in my head, Fourlets would be a nice in-between tempo where it's still impressive because it's fast and it kind of works with the three, four feel. So I just jot that down. Okay, I want to do a long fourlet roll because it would be like the right feel and it would be an impressive skill. And another skill I, I jotted down was just like threes. Some version of threes because um, that's, an, that's another skill I know they worked on a lot and it works well in the 16th note figure. So you can see, this is kind of the skeleton of how I'd start um, fairly basically. I'm always, almost always nowadays, starting with the battery outline and just like big accents that I hear in my head as I'm playing through, um, you know, if there's a piano outline, if, if I'm literally listening to it and whatever I hear in my head, it's really important parts I know that need to be in there. Those are the first things I include. And I always have kind of a rolling list in my head for each group certain skills that I should include and I make a, a priority list. So all of this is culminating to giving myself parameters, which I talked about a little bit with the piano reduction as well, but I'm trying to give myself more things to latch on to. So like, I know I want an extended roll somewhere and I know I want three somewhere. Now it's just giving me less things to fill in. And now what I'm really just composing is like, the transitions between these skills. But I, if I give myself like, yes, I definitely want these three skills, that's taking up, you know, maybe I do one skill per phrase or I give myself some goal or obvious checkpoint like that to make it a little bit more manageable instead of just looking at this and saying, oh my God, I have four full phrases of whatever I can think of. It could be anything, right? I start small, make it easy to digest with the battery outline and then some skill sets and then put it together. So let's fast forward and check out um, what the final product ended up being. You can see how I incorporated some of these skills and um, in the battery outline. All right, and then if we jump ahead to seeing the uh, final version, you can see um, I have my I think in my actual final version, before I send out the score, I usually get rid of the battery outline. But I, I added it back in here for this purpose, just for the uh, percussion feature, so you could see kind of how I expanded it out into the battery. Um, so you can see I kept this big accented bass rhythm, made it unison up here in the battery. It's still really just skeleton, you know, maybe you know, you could interpret if you went the opposite direction. If you took the snare part and tried to make an outline, it could be seen differently. There's more than one way to see it. That's why I like the battery outline recently, because it, it tells Tyler, you know, here, hey, this is what I thought of first. When you're rearranging mallet parts, you know, maybe try to line up with those same phrases or, you know, do interactions with them. Oh, yeah, you can see... I wanted to point out a couple times I actually ended up using these skills so you can see like right here in the fourth and fifth measure right away I try to include this skill right later on I kind of combined but two ideas I had in the skeleton I knew I wanted to do a rhythmic um, change going into the end of one of the phrases from duple to triple and I also made the uh, the threes skill set uh, apply to that so you hear the duple to triple but the sticking is still three so I kind of tried to combine those two things and then before the last big push 
tempo change, I f try to find a way to incorporate this long roll idea as well, and you hear that. So let me play it once, show you how, maybe I'll show you at least how the, um, how the snare drum part turned out for these first couple phrases. A couple other things I wanted to point out is maybe some of the uh, melodic approach versus visual approach in, um, well, especially in quads if you're talking about melodic versus visual, but even in bass drumming, you know, sometimes I can choose to write a part that I want to be flashy, but maybe doesn't sound as good tonally, or, you know, vice versa. If it's not, maybe the tonality is more important than the actual crazy split hand-to-hand -hand part. It just, it, you know, depends on the situation. So let's listen to the beginning of this quad part. All right, cool. So here's a perfect example of maybe how I use the drums visually, but also tonally in this phrase, it's easiest to point out how we're using, um, how you can use the drum three versus the drum four to like make some tension release going on. So, you know, between these four bars, I start with the drum four and we drop dynamically. And then all the accents that I want to be in a low drummer stick out, I make sure they're over with the right hand on drum three and then the first time you hear drum four, again, that resolves down after the quads have this little window. You know, that was the decision I make on purpose. And I write the quad parts, you know, especially in this moment, I'm trying to like write a crossover, write some scrapes to make it look cool, but keep it all on the right side of the drums, stay away from drum four. So listen, listen to those six measures again and hear how you can kind of hear drum four come in and then it's all leading to the end of that last roll, which you, you'll hear the tonic um, resolution on drum four again. And then starting the next phrase back on drum one is the decision I made, especially in this chart because it's a waltz feel. I, I tried really to often go between low pitch, high pitch to start each measure you know, so you can get the easy one, two, three, one, two, three feeling to come through. Uh, and you can see that in the bass drum part come through a couple times too, even right here. Starting high, ending low, right? Let's hear this, um, how this phrase turned out and the finished product. I'm singing the melody in my head, maybe you can't hear it, um, but I wanted to play it once with just the battery so you could see, maybe follow along how the battery outline relates. Now let's, let's hear it once with the front ensemble parts um, that Tyler interpreted through my battery parts and the melody already there. And you know, it, it goes through, we usually go through a couple different um, versions of it. I'll kind of have a battery outline and some skeleton stuff. He'll send me same thing, skeleton stuff, maybe a for ensemble, we'll go back a couple times and this is what it ends up being at the end. I'll start a little bit before.
cool. So you can kind of hear Tyler kept the melody going, still did a bunch of embellishments, even picked up, you know, on the four-let idea because I felt really strongly about that um, with the long roll and he found a way to tie that in with the dotted eights and dotted quarters in it. It worked awesome, I think. Yeah, it sounded great by the end. I think one other thing I, I'd like to bring up um, quickly is just the um, the limits of notation and the limits of the notation program, um, especially related to dynamics, right? In, in general, I, I felt like notation, like Western notation can be a little limiting, you know, even something like this. How that's really gonna sound or really be played Maybe that one little left-hand accent's not gonna stick out quite as much. Um, you know, every accent isn't made equal, essentially, but sometimes I've always wished there were more options. And you can see maybe here, I've even, I use um, staccato markings as half accents often. Sometimes I even use marcato as an extra accent. So I try to make as many levels as I can, but that's still, you know, giving you maybe four options of different accents, if you're lucky, within an infinite context. So I sometimes try to be, um, I don't know, try to embrace that it can't be so specific, knowing that the majority of the shaping and expression has to come from the teachers and, and doing it live. So um, I've been trying to accept the fact recently that I can't be too explicit and being too explicit can, with your dynamics and markings and stuff like this can maybe actually get in the way sometimes. I think as a teacher, I can get, um, you know, I can get more out of the players and get them to play more musically if I'm teaching it to them live and saying, yes, this whole phrase is in the context of forte or piano, but that doesn't mean every single note is forte or every single accent is forte and just being able to explain that in person. So recently I've been trying to be, um, I've been trying to do less markings than maybe even seen here. But with that being said, in the in the notation software, sometimes I, because having a good MP3 and having good playback is sometimes important, especially for a high school uh, group that needs like a playback track, maybe they use it to practice too. Sometimes I do something like this, or I do a lot of stuff like this. So, because I know the, the habits of virtual drumline playback or just sound library playback sometime with notation software. I'll do a lot of hidden dynamics like this. So you can see I have, maybe I'll write like a mezzo forte or mezzo piano right after an accent because I want a roll to be softer, but you know in real life they would interpret it that way anyway. So maybe that's a little bit more accurate than this one. Right, little subtle differences of things like that. I think it, um, I could show you examples of scores where if I zoom in all the way to the battery parts, you can see like sometimes little, every accent might have a different type of dynamic marking, but they're all hidden because that's not something I want the player to actually see. That's just something I want to come across in the playback to make it easier for them maybe, or for like the drill writer, whoever's using the sound files that I'm creating. Um, yeah, I, I could go way more in depth with that conversation. I just always think it's important to bring that up, that you can be too explicit uh, in the actual version that the players are going to see, right? One more thing I wanted to talk about that sometimes people ask me about is my experience, you know, writing shows with the writing partner, which like Tyler Sammons, which is 90% of all the shows I've ever written are with Tyler, um, versus you know, writing a whole chart by yourself. And I've had both experiences, you know, there's pros and cons to each. I, you know, personally, I love writing shows with another person and I love writing them with Tyler because we're so close, you know, so we've worked together really well. We've known each other a long time. Like the cohesion makes the process easier for sure. I mean, the ability to bounce ideas off each other and maybe, you know, I give him a new idea, he gives me a new idea in the process of writing a chart um, is irreplaceable. You know, it's great. It, I wouldn't trade it for the world. The couple shows that I do write by myself, those are fun too. 
and obviously the pros of that is that you get to make all the decisions, but the con of that is you have to make all of the decisions by yourself, right? So personally, you know, I, I, both experiences are valuable, but um, if you have the chance, I would say maybe do both yourself. I mean, I think it's important to be able to do pit and battery, and I know Tyler has done that too. It's like done the whole, the whole chart, but it's also helpful if you get the experience to once or twice um, to write with somebody else and, and hear those ideas and get that experience working together. And sometimes it just clicks and it goes really well. I hope uh, some of the information I covered was helpful to those of you that are watching. I wanted to thank Dynasty for giving me this outlet, this platform to talk about some of these things. Um, please reach out if you have any questions or comments about my presentation. I always love to hear from you. Thanks so much for watching.